Immediately after their cosmic treason, which is exactly what this is, of disobeying God and eating the forbidden fruit, the couple has begun to take on characteristics of God? No. They are now taking characteristics of the serpent, Satan. This insight brings us to an important principle we must never forget, is that images will always be transformed into their object of worship. The ultimate price of attempting to be like God is alienation from Him both physically and spiritually. May we never forget only God possesses the power to redeem. Good morning. Guga and Rachel send their love. They are having a fantastic time at the conference and some alone time in Albuquerque. And But they did text this morning how much they miss being here and, and miss everyone here. So I wanted to pass that along. It never changes when I get up here. It's just heavy. It's overwhelming. And Guga is the same way. The weight, the weight of God's word as you're preparing these messages and the struggle and your prayers are desperately needed and wanted because the struggle is real, real against the enemy. And I thank you for everyone who has prayed. I love you all very, very much. And your prayers, I pray, will be answered today. Luke three twenty one, And I will take selected members out of the genealogy so we can spend more time on the text itself. Now it happened that when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven. You are my beloved son. And you I am well pleased. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Arubabel, the son of Sheetiel, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of Noah, the son of Adam, the son of God. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, please fill me with your spirit that I will be directed to say what you, my Lord and God, would have me to say. God the Spirit, please fill me and empower me to deliver your word faithfully today. May the Holy Spirit give me the strength that I so desperately need to preach today. Despite my many limitations and many weaknesses, Lord, your word does the work. O oh, Spirit of God, magnify your strength in your servant. His weakness and enable him to honor his Lord and God. We ask that the truth of the word will transform us more and more into the image of Christ. I pray also that those who do not know you, that they will have their hearts opened to believe the truth, that salvation is only through the Lord Jesus Christ, and that all of us need to be saved. Lord, produce in us conviction of sin and a deep repentance, and a living and fruitful faith in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Yahweh, my rock and my Redeemer. Lord, speak through your word, for your slaves are listening. I ask this for your glory and your glory alone. In the name is above all names, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we see in Luke, Jesus is declared the Son of God by a heavenly voice. And the Holy Spirit rests on him to empower him to be perfectly obedient. 
to God in fulfilling his ministry and confirming Jesus' status as the Messiah. And as Messiah, the Lord Jesus fulfills what is typified by the three anointed offices that are found in the Old Testament, the prophet, the priest, the king. Now, Jesus is the long-expected Son of God, the better and greater Adam, the greater and better Israel, and David, who fulfills this threefold ministry. But today, we are going back. We're going to go back and look at, at the threefold ministry in the Old Testament and what that means to us in the drama of redemption. As image bearers of God and the people of God, we need to know how bad the bad news is and understand the purpose or goal of God's redemptive plan. God's desire is to dwell with his people. So we are set, set in the groundwork today, and next time we'll start focusing on Christ's fulfillment of these ministries. And I do believe that this message ties beautifully into Guga's sermon from last week. So in Titus 2.13b, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all lawlessness and purify for himself a people, a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. We are going to focus on a people of his own possession. Because next time we'll be focused on the Lord Jesus Christ and that mission of purifying his people and what that means to the church as we are possession of Christ who was bought with his life, us. So we're going back, back to Old Testament, what that means to us, that we are made in the image of God and are people of God in the drama of our redemption. We need to understand our need for a Savior. And God's desire, His ultimate goal throughout history is to dwell with His people. Now, when we say his people, this usually brings up some questions. Who are his people? Well, the church and Israel distinct. These invariably will always come up when we talk about this. Now, the, now, we answer this question, how we answer this question will affect how we read Scripture. Now, the apostles passionately argued that the church stands in the continuity with the people of God in the Old Testament from Adam, Adam, excuse me, Adam to Israel. As such, the church is called to rule over the created order, to mediate God's glory to the nations, and to embody God's law in every aspect of our life. This is the threefold ministry of king, priest, and prophet. Now, we will be looking at this through the lens of what is called reform theology, called covenant theology. That is, a broad framework of the Bible is organized in accordance with various covenants. The covenant of redemption, covenant of works, covenant of grace. As Glad writes, one of the fundamental aspects of covenant theology is that one people of God spans the history of redemption from Genesis 1 and 2 to Revelation 21 and 22 there remains one covenant community as a side note reformed covenant theology is distinct from dispensational theology which originated about the 1830s started gathering steam 1900s so dispensationalism is a somewhat modern framework to look at Scripture. It argues that the Bible is organized into distinct dispensations or strict epics, time periods. At the heart of dispensationalism is a separation between the church and ethnic Israel. That these are distinct groups of people and that each functions within its own dispensation. It's just another way to interpret the Bible. 
we are doing Reformed theology, we will be doing covenantal in our look. And more specifically today, we're going to be looking at biblical theology. We're going to be looking at this, the people of God, and us as image bearers. Now, granted, all theology should be biblical in the sense it conforms to the Bible. But in biblical theology, refers to particular theological discipline. Biblical theology answers the question, how is a particular doctrine of the Bible developed in relation to redemptive history? So we're going to look at this doctrine, that the one people of God span the history of redemption, as we said from Genesis 1 to 2, all the way to Revelation 21 to 22. And there remains one covenantal community. The ultimate goal today is to give God's people confidence. That they are part of the restored people of God. The true Israel. And why is this important? Because we all struggle with our identity. Let's be honest. Regardless of our age... We long to be a part of a group. We want rights and privileges of that group. We want significance and acceptance. Yet, we also want our individuality. We want to be treasured for who we are. Now, these old age pursuits transcend time and culture. These needs are endemic to who we are as humans. I can't emphasize enough that the Bible has an incredibly high view of the person. Perhaps higher than most Christians even realize. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation teaches us that humanity is imbued with astonishing, astonishing qualities. Humanity is the crown of creation. Since we are made in the divine image, we have incredible significance and meaning. But, always a but, the fall certainly has perverted how we think and we act, has it not? But it did not lessen our worth to God. So the other, another goal today is that we would be reminded of our value to God, who we are in Christ, and what the new creation holds in store for us. I want to give God's people confidence that they are part of a restored people of God, the true Israel. And there are many examples in the New Testament where Paul has spoken about this. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. The Apostle Paul has in mind a number of prominent Old Testament passages as he warns these Gentile Christians. Verse 14, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with dark? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? No name for Satan. Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the sanctuary of God with idols? For we are a sanctuary of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. In those five verses, Paul alludes and quotes a number of Old Testament texts here. He quotes from Exodus 25, Exodus 29, Leviticus 26, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 37, Isaiah 52, Ezekiel 20, 2 Samuel 7, 1 Chronicles 17, and Hosea 1, in those five verses. What's remarkable is that these Old Testament texts refer to Israel. 
Indeed, the passage from 2 Samuel is in reference to King David. So the question is, why would Paul cite these texts and appear, that appear to be confined to Israel and David and apply them to a group of Gentiles at Corinth? Good question. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, the next verse. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. His words in this text are even more pointed when he claims we have these promises. Therefore, we have them. So he is telling the Corinthian congregation, a church filled primarily with, primarily with Gentile Christians, they are aligned with Israel. So much so that Paul includes the Corinthians in the lineage of Israel. When he tells them the first generation of Israelites are our fathers. And fathers is also translated here as ancestors or forefathers. 1 Corinthians 10, 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers, we were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Though the Corinthians are not ethnically part of Israel, they enjoy complete identification with Israel through their position in Christ, the embodiment of the true Israel. The Corinthians must embrace their identity as true Israel and the true temple of God by not morally compromising Christian living that flows naturally from our identification as Israel. So that's the introduction. Now we'll get start getting into it. So we're going to attempt to briefly walk through the Bible's teaching on what it means to be part of God's family. We will do this by getting an understanding of the nature of the covenant community and possessing the divine image. God uses covenants in preserving and restoring his image in humanity. We will examine the nature of of the people of God, starting with Genesis, through the lens of being in God's image. We will next time pick up what that means in the New Testament. Also, we're going to explore the threefold office of king, priest, and prophet, as well as creation, temple, and redemption, as these are all intertwined and interconnected to one another. We will move on from Adam to Israel this morning. And we know that Jesus, the long-expected Son of God, the better and greater Adam, Israel, and David, fulfills this threefold ministry. But for us to understand what it means to be part of a people of God, we must begin with the creation of Adam and Eve in the divine image. What does it mean that Adam and Eve are in God's likeness and what are his expectations of them? So let's begin at the beginning. Genesis 1 through 2. God creates a vast cosmic temple where he dwells and sovereignly rules. Eden ought to be understood as a mountain that houses God's glory. God's glory is at the center of created order. His glory sustains and nourishes all living things. This insight about Eden being the holy of holies on earth demonstrates two important things. God ultimately wants to dwell with the created order in all its fullness. And Adam and Eve will play a critical role in accomplishing his goals. So this begins with the creation of the cosmos and humanity's role within it. Humanity is the crown of creation. Day six. Since we are made in the divine image, we have incredible, incredible significance and meaning. 
Humanity is fashioned to dwell in God's presence and task with the responsibility to bring His glory to the ends of the earth. So if you look at this model, that Eden, the mountain, holy of holies, where God resides, His glory. Garden of Eden would be the holy place. And then the outer world would be the outer courts. You will see this pattern throughout all the Scripture. Where we go? Mount Sinai, same thing. The temple, same thing. Christ, He fulfills all that. So God originally had a covenant with Adam, and it constituted him to function as a ruling king, a worshiping priest, and revelatory prophet in the Garden of Eden. It's a threefold office rooted in the capacities as God's image bearer. In Genesis 2, 15 through 17, Then Yahweh took the man and set him in the garden, the Garden of Eden, to cultivate and to keep it. You can translate keep, can also mean watch, can also mean guard. He's got a task. And Yahweh God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may surely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat from it. For in the day you eat from it, you will surely die. Then Genesis 1, 26, 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, so that he will have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky, over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now Adam was created first. So Adam is responsible for leading, for teaching, and for representing his family. Genesis 2.22, 2 Corinthians 11.3, 1 Timothy 2. So Adam thus is the representative head of all humanity. So when both Adam and Eve fell, the blame falls squarely on Adam. Authority on earth was given to Adam. He was to express it lovingly and creatively as creation's prophet, as his priest, as his king, to all the ends of the earth. He was to spread God's glory throughout the whole earth. But Adam failed in his calling and fell short of God's glory. As prophet, Adam should have been meditating on God's law. Genesis 2, 16 to 17. That's what the law he had at the time. He should have rebuked the serpent's lies about God's word with the word of God. As a priest, Adam should have rid the sanctuary of Eden from its defilement. The serpent, Satan, embodies evil and rebellion. The first priest should have recognized the uncleanliness of the creature and eradicated it from God's temple. As a king representing God on earth, Adam should have quickly subdued the serpent. He should have defended the garden and defended Eve. The fall reveals that Adam and Eve failed to live up to their identity as images of God. God designed them to rule, to worship, to embody God's law, yet they failed to keep the covenant of works in those all three respects. The take home from that little part is when God's word is ignored, sin is inevitable. We all know this. You stay out of God's word, you are in some terrible places, and you are weak. The consequences of this rebellion. Immediately after their cosmic treason, which is exactly what this is, of disobeying God and eating the forbidden fruit, the couple is beginning to take on characteristics of God? No. They are now taking characteristics of the serpent, Satan, and not God at all. 
They, like the serpent, begin to begin attempting to deceive and hide and shift blame. This insight brings us to an important principle we must never forget is that images will always be transformed into their object of worship. G.K. Beale in What We Become, What We Worship, very good book, states, what people revere, they resemble, either for ruin or restoration. Images are meant to reflect and refract God. So if Adam and Eve obey God, they become more like him. Their divine image was to become more and more aligned with God's character. The more that we worship and adore Christ, the more we will be transformed into his image. This is what sanctification entails, beloved. The process of becoming more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. But, again, but they believed and trusted in the serpent instead of God. So they began to be transformed into the serpent's image. Instead of manifesting the traits of God on earth, they and their descendants would manifest the traits of Satan. And as we read Genesis 3, like Satan or the serpent, they are now attempting to deceive and lie. They are acting like the new they're they're acting like their new father. The father of lies. If you turn to John 8, 42, let's listen to what Jesus himself says. Jesus said to them, John 8, 42. If God were your father, were, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come of myself, but he has sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you can not hear my word. And when I read that, I immediately go to Ephesians 2.1. And you were dead, 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 dead. How can you hear if you're dead? You are of your father, who? The devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. So their image now is transformed. God then outlines the curses, Genesis 3, 16 through 19, that, will be, that he will execute because of their disobedience. The curse then climaxes in death. The ultimate price of attempting to be like God is alienation from him both physically and spiritually. Paul's mean in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He means everyone. Adam and Eve sin, his, their descendants sin, you and I have sinned, everyone. We're now under the curse. But, inside the curse of the serpent, there's a profound promise that he gives us. Genesis 3.15 that God will put enmity between the serpent and his ungodly offspring and the godly descendants. So we have two nations now, ungodly, godly. These, as Google has said, these are the only two nations God has. You believers, unbelievers. Here we have the war of the seeds. The basic outline that will per permeate 
the remainder of the biblical story until Revelation 21 and 22. The fate of the godly and the ungodly are intertwined. The godly are those who enjoy a restored image, whereas the ungodly are those who have a perverted image or an anti-image. Antichrist, anti-image. The term anti-image refers to that individual who is hostile to God and is opposite of those who enjoy a restored image. The anti-image still retains all three offices of being in the image of God. Yet, it uses the offices for its own selfish ambition. Here the term anti-image is apt description of the serpent seed. The two lines will wage war with one another, culminating in a decisive defeat of evil. He, a righteous descendant of Eve, shall bruise the serpent, Satan, on his head. Genesis 3.15 Redemption is guaranteed. A godly king who is in the, in the pristine, perfect image of God will vanquish the serpent, the embodiment of the anti-image. At the very end of history, this will occur. All those who trust in this Redeemer will inherit his victory. This king will accomplish what Adam and Eve failed to accomplish. They failed to rule over the serpent and rid Eden of it. So now a faithful descendant will arise and obey where they disobeyed. Some theologians refer to this promise as a covenant of grace. Because God himself will ensure the success of this future king and the preservation of his godly community. This is an unconditional agreement. What this means is it's not dependent on human effort. As God himself will ensure its fulfillment. So Jesus Christ is the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15. And the image of God. Colossians 1. The threefold offices reaches its consummation in him. Also, immediately after their cosmic treason of disobeying God, Adam and Eve realized they were naked. Genesis 3, 7. The word here for naked is also related to the Hebrew word for crafty. In Exodus, Joshua, and Job, they attempted to hide from the Lord and cover their shame with clothing made from fig leaves. But God did not accept these garments crafted of their own ingenuity. Their garments made of fig leaves were unacceptable to God. So God made them acceptable garments. Genesis 3.21 Then Yahweh God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. We see here Already, God is beginning the process of restoring Adam's image so that he could rule, worship, and obey. And may we never forget, only God possesses the power to redeem. Though God begins to restore Adam and Eve's image, and the first couple once again enjoy some harmony with God, the damage has already been done. The fall has severely affected the first couple and the created order. Sin dwells within and affects every aspect of their and our image. Humanity and creation now rebel against this creator. Because of Adam and Eve's corrupt images, the proclivity to assert independence from God, the Lord expels them from the garden. Adam and Eve were to expel the serpent from the garden, but because they disobeyed, they, ironically, are now expelled as unclean like the serpent. So from Genesis 4 to Revelation 20, the Bible narrates great hostility between those whose images are beginning to be restored and those whose images begin to collapse from within. 
We begin to see the image of God collapsing on itself immediately. As Cain, Cain uses his royal identity for his own gain. The rejection of Cain's offering is not the quality of the offering, but the character of the worshiper. Abel, the restored image, approached God in humility and in faith. Cain, the anti-image, in pride and self-righteousness. And we see the anti-image kills the restored image. Cain's perverted image brings honor to himself and his descendants. But the restored image of Seth and his family glorifies the Lord, beloved. The hallmark of a restored image is whether one's actions honor the name of the Lord. As a result of the fall, the nature of being in God's image became self-destructive. The fall didn't erase the divine image, but it obviously did pervert it. The kingly, kingly, priestly, and prophetic aspects of God's image are now tools for destruction. Humanity was created to bring glory to God, but now humanity will attempt to bring glory to itself. Just look outside. This is idolatry of the highest sort. The worship and adulation of one's self. The ungodly line as anti-kings will rule viciously by abusing one another and the created order. The anti-priest will also defile the created order and worship everything but the one true God. The anti-prophets will deceive and embody all teaching that is hostile to God. Despite the fall, the goal of Genesis 1 through 2 remains intact. God's desire is to dwell intimately with his restored people in a new creation. His commission to Adam and Eve to fill the earth with godly offspring is never shelved. The same commission was passed on to Noah. Be fruitful, increase in number, multiply on the earth, and increase upon it, Genesis 9. Noah, a second Adam figure, is responsible to form a community of godly kings and priests and prophets. But as Adam, Noah fails. The commission is then picked up and applied to Abraham. But when Abraham receives the commission, we see a shift now in the covenant. The call of Abraham signals a new phase in God's plan. In the fulfillment of the divine commission of Genesis 1.28, what began with a pair will now continue on in an entire nation in the promised land. The narrative of Genesis is a story of God graciously restoring and preserving his people. Genesis 17. Unfortunately, time does not permit us to explore Noah and Abraham any further. So we'll move on to Exodus. Exodus opens with Jacob's offspring, the 70. Signifying new beginnings, a new humanity in Egypt. As anti-image, Pharaoh attempts to rule over Israel, the firstborn of God. Exodus 4. By oppressing the Israelites through hard labor, so God will then turn over the firstborn of Egypt. God will bring his people out of the clutches of Egypt through the waters of redemption to Mount Sinai. Israel is formed out of the chaos of Egypt and planted in Eden, which is the base of Mount Sinai. God is fulfilling his promises to Adam and Eve and to Abraham. He promised that Abraham's descendants would be a mighty nation, and God is making good on those promises. 
Many argue that Israel's experience at Sinai parallels the cre creation account of Adam and Eve. Just as God created Adam and Eve and installed them in Eden, so He too creates Israel and install, installs them in the Promised Land. God manufactures Israel in His pristine image in the iron smelton furnace of Egypt. Often in the Bible, the people of God function as a single unit. For example, the Apostle Paul depicts the church, a community composed of individuals as a body. 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, Colossians 1. The community of redeemed saints, despite its incredible diversity, functions as a single entity in light of its union with Christ. The same could be said for the people of Israel gathered at Sinai who are collectively deemed the firstborn son of God and a corporate Adam. Viewing the church as the collective body of Christ has tremendous applications for our daily lives if we can grasp the significance of being in solidarity with one another, we realize the gravity of our behavior. We do not sin alone. Sin not only affects us in a personal manner, but will radiate out within the body of Christ. Sin harms our hearts and the hearts of those around us. On the flip side, righteous living reinforces the solidarity we enjoy within the church. We are in this together. If you hurt, we all hurt. If you rejoice, we all rejoice. So like Adam and Eve, God creates Israel as an image, a corporate one. This image is designed to reflect and refract his character on the earth. Image and God's glory go hand in hand. Mount Sinai is a focal point for much of the Pentateuch. It is where God would graciously promise to Israel that he would be their God and they would be his people. Israel as a nation is created to be kings and priests and prophets. Once again, we need to keep in mind that these three offices do overlap with one another, so sometimes it can be difficult to parse them out into three distinct strands. But Israel was to function corporately as king, responsible for evaluating and judging all forms of sin in the promised land. They were to bring order to the chaos of Canaan. As kings, Israel was to bring everything under subjugation to the reign of God. If Israel obeys God's decrees, God will fight on behalf of the nation. If Israel disobeys, though, God will fight against them. And isn't it so tempting for us to take the matters always into our own hands? Rather than unswervingly trust God, instead of walking by faith, like in Corinthians 2 Corinthians 5. Our natural pattern of behavior is to walk by sight and attempt to govern our own lives. We are the DIY, do-it-yourself group. The Bible tells us time and time again that only God is sovereign and all-knowing and that we should trust Him and Him alone in every situation. So Israel's as priest. If Israel perfectly obeys God's law, then the nation would be a kingdom of priests. Priests simply are charged with ensuring that humanity is prepared to worship the one true God. In addition to mediating God's glory, another dimension of Israel's priestly service is their commitment to preserving the sanctity of of the temple and the promised land. 
As Israel settles in the promised land, the nation must immediately expel all forms of spiritual uncleanliness. Sound familiar? Israel's prophets, central to the, prof- to the prophetic office of Israel, is a preservation of the first and second commandments. To have no other gods and to not make for yourself an image. God alone creates images. Images cannot create images. Israel's greatest struggle is idolatry. All it takes is a cursorial glance throughout her history yields a considerable amount of material dedicated to Israel's failure in this regard. Prophet after prophet after prophet pleads with Israel and her kings to resist the temptation to worship other gods. Just like in Eden, the fall happened quick. The fall of Israel in the desert happened quick at Mount Sinai. It was immediate. Israelites failed as kings, for one, to believe that God would rule over their enemies. Moses was still on the mountain, and they asked Aaron to manufacture a God who would go before them and protect them. Exodus 32. They failed as priests because they worshipped an idolatrous image. They failed as prophets because they failed to preserve and protect the first two commandments. The result of Israel's idolatry is like Adam and Eve's fall. Absolutely catastrophic. As 3,000 Israelites are killed at the hands of their own people. Despite Moses' attempt to make atonement for Israel's sin, God promises to punish them for their sin. Like Adam... Israel is to put into a sacred space to exercise a kingly priestly role. Like Adam, Israel is given laws by which the divine space is to be retained. Finally, Israel, like Adam, transgresses the law and so too is expelled from the divine space. As the book of Numbers unfolds, we learn that except for Caleb and Joshua, the entire generation of Israelites would never enter the promised land for their sin. One concrete effect of Israel's sin is now the splintering of the offices of king, priest, and prophet. All three offices were united with Adam and Eve in the garden and with Israel at Mount Sinai. But as Israel's story unfolds, we learn that the three offices begin to splinter now. Every Israelite bears God's image and thus possesses the offices of the king, priest, and prophet. Yet the Mosaic Covenant formalizes a threefold distinction and organizes them into three distinct offices. So, I want to now return to where we started. But who is Israel? Does this term primarily primarily denote ethnic relationship between Abraham and his descendants? Or does it primarily refer to a spiritual status between God and his people? Certainly the Old Testament does employ terms to Israel that refer to a physical or ethnic dimension to the people of God. But the spiritual dimension remains paramount. To be part of Israel means to be part of a covenant community. The Old Testament is filled with examples of non-Israelites or Gentiles joining the covenant community and receiving an inheritance in the land. Their relationship to the covenant is determined ultimately by faith in God's promises. Of all those many examples, let's turn to Psalm 87. Yahweh loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. 
Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. Shall I mention Rahab, which would be Egypt, and Babylon? Among those who know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this one was born there. But of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. And the Most High himself will establish her. Yahweh will count when he registers the peoples. This one was born there. When he's speaking of the Gentiles being born in Zion, it's at the very end of history and becoming indistinguishable from ethnic Israelites. Israel is part of a much larger story. God's commitment to securing a people group from all ethnicities for himself and dwelling intimately with them. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Israel, the church are all a part of the same covenant community within different epochs of biblical history. Fundamentally, our relationship with God and his people rests not on our DNA, but on our, your divine image. Those who enjoy a fundamentally restored image are considered part of true Israel. When God changed Jacob's name to Israel, his DNA was not altered like some comic book story book, superhero. The name Israel symbolized a new dimension of Jacob's relationship with God, signaling divine blessings on him. Likewise, when we trust in Christ for our salvation, we receive God's covenantal blessing by becoming legitimate children of Jacob or Israel. Thus, in a very real sense, when we sin, we repeat the fall of Adam and Eve and the fall of the nation Israel. The story always remains the same throughout the Old Testament. It wasn't until the coming of Christ that the pattern was broken. Though he was tempted just like Adam and Eve and the nation of Israel, he remained faithful. His faithfulness is passed on to those who trust in him. It is only through Christ's perfect life that we are freed from our idolatry. Freed from our idolatry and escape the wrath of God. Who does God save us from? God. Christ bore the unfaithful, idolatrous behavior of his people, of us, so that we could become perfectly restored images in the sight of God through Christ's righteousness. We would do well to remind ourselves and each other daily of the seriousness of our sin and of the grace that is found in Christ's work on our behalf. Let us pray. Father God, I, I am overwhelmed every time I go through this, every time we look at this, that your goal is to dwell with a people. A people of your own possession purchased at the ultimate price of God the Son, Jesus Christ, to bring and gather a people to yourself. And we are in the ready but not yet. We know how this ends in Revelation 20 and 20, 21 and 22. When we will dwell with you holy God and we will be your people but until then Lord strengthen us for we are weak keep our eyes focused on perfecter of our faith Jesus Christ 
Lord, guard our hearts and minds in Christ. Give us the grace to love one another abundantly, bear in all things with one another. Lord, strengthen us, empower us to root out all that evil and sin that continues to be in us. May we continue to mortify it, to kill it, until the day that it is gone and we are in your presence. Lord, we love you. Lord, we ask that you will always be our first love, our true love, to your glory forever and ever. Amen. So let us stand and worship our triune God who has made a way for one day to dwell with him.